So this is a person who is hands on. It is not just that just because he is a CEO, he just gives strategic direction or just plays the annual goals. He keeps traveling to various regions, uh, understands the different markets and then uh, does what is necessary for each of those regions. I think this is something that you need to look out for in management whenever you are evaluating various businesses. This is the talk for today. Okay, I'm happy to take any questions or comments. Uh, who is he addressing? Who is he talking to? Uh, is he talking to his own employees or uh, He's talking to uh, the MBA class, uh, Graduate School of Business, uh, Stanford University. Uh, incidentally, the entire video is online. So if you go to YouTube and uh, search for Carlos Brito Stanford, you will get this entire video. Uh, currently, I have just put some clips. Uh, this is maybe 30 minutes of clips. The entire video is about an hour. And which year was this? Very current? Yeah, maybe early 2014 or late 2014. You mentioned about this Heinz takeover. Now you study the Heinz balance sheet. Out of maybe ten billion dollars, I think around nine billion dollars is the value of the brand. So what they are paying for essentially is the Heinz brand, no other assets as such. And now you are seeing the same kind of you know, valuations. Uh, Ratan Tata investing in Snapdeal. Now you know when you think from basic Baniya concept, and you say Tumko Dukan Lagna Hai, the first question is. What is my payback time? Is it 5 years? Is it 10 years? And none of these seem to make mathematical sense. Even in you know, a 20 year payback, it seems difficult for them to even recover their own investment. Maybe the growth will you know, cover it instead of 20 years to 15 years. So does this really all these acquisitions do they really sound logical to you? Snapdeal is a different thing. So uh, Snapdeal I think we should discuss in the month of October, we'll have a presentation on uh, Google and some other tech companies and things like that. See, what rate of return that we can get out of our business is a function of the opportunity cost. Now, in an environment where we have low inflation, we have low interest rates, uh, Maybe 10% return on capital may not be that bad a thing where uh, initially part 10-12% where some part of it is funded by debt or whatever. Again, when these guys come in, they look at what is the possibility of making money in 2 or 3 years kind of time frame. A lot of the times when they acquire businesses, there is inefficiency either on the supply side, as we saw in the case of Brahma and Antarctica and all, or there are cost inefficiencies which can be removed. Uh, again, as I mentioned, uh, these fellows are ruthless in terms of costs, and uh, these fellows are very similar to uh, the leverage buyout kings of the earlier era. If you read this book, uh, Barbarians at the Gate, relating to RJR Nabisco, this was a tobacco and biscuits company, iconic brands, but they had a fleet of private jets, they had uh, fancy uh, furnishings, maybe some gold plated water taps in the bathroom and things like that. The CEO used the private jet to transport his pet dog. No one else was on the <laughs> flight. The pet dog had to go from one place to the other, the private jet flew. So those were the kind of those were the kind of inefficiencies that were there. So essentially when you even if the sales turnover remains the same, if you remove that cost, the operating margins and the profits simply shoot up dramatically and when people are lethargic, when people have not given focus to sales and uh, market share and sales targets and all of that, the moment they bring the energy into the company, the company is a very different company. 
So you can't evaluate these things on historical earnings. A lot of the lot of times they do a, some work in terms of what is the potential and where we can take these companies. Some of these deals have to be looked at in that context. We're not next to the other things. Yep. You know, uh, coming back to Buffett's logic about the uh, board being more important than the, uh, uh, I mean, the, than the person running it. Uh, if you if you see even in terms of uh, 3G capital, I'm assuming most of their businesses are consumer facing. I have not seen in in depth, but uh, like you know, we have a company, I think private equity company called Everstone Capital, which I think does again acquires restaurants, acquires all these brands. So how much, according to you, would you again allocate to Buffett's logic of even though he focuses on management so much? On the fact that ultimately he's bought consumer franchisees which have great uh, fundamental economics. So I think both are important. So it's not that these guys don't realize, especially when they are acquiring uh, companies like Heinz and Budweiser and all. Obviously, they have not uh, gone and acquired some uh, airline, for example. They have acquired a company with high, potentially high return on capital and low capital intensity and so on. But what it means is that a very enthusiastic person at the helm and having this kind of a win-win situation where the employee becomes a partner of the company and one of the clips which I had to delete and due to paucity of time was where he uh, talks about this whole partnership concept. He says that if at some stage an employee feels that I want to quit this group and start a business on my own, then we have failed. He says that I want people who think like an owner and he compares this with a rental car. He says a professional manager, an executive works in a company like he's driving a rental car. A rental car if the suspension goes bad in a week, <coughs> you don't care because you have to give the car back to the rental company. Whereas if it's your own car and you are going to own the car for maybe 5-7 years, 10 years, then you will drive the car very carefully. If there's a bumpy road, you will drive slowly. He says, there is this saying, don't be gentle on the rental. So, he says that I am looking at only people who come as a business owner or as a partner. And once you get those people, the same business can do dramatically differently as compared to under professional managers. So it's not either or, it's not franchise business or capable managers, it's combining both the elements. I mean, he talked about culture, you know, he talked about uh, you have to imbibe company's culture and then worrying about a country's culture which is being taken over, you know, from that region. But I like to mention Maruti's example over here, you know, when Suzuki realized that because of the contractual labor there were some issues and people were killed in the, you know, and that was really sh shocking for Japan. You know, someone from Japan can't imagine something like this happening in India. So how can you just ignore countries like, you know, when you're taking over different companies? You just mentioned about, you know, uh, transferring our culture to that particular, but I don't think it's So not. actually the problem happened because of not having Japanese culture, I would say. Thank you. Uh, in India. So in Japan, I don't think you have this concept of contract labor. In Japan, the employment is for life. I guess they have now ceased to so, employ. So, when you are, if you have a system where two employees are doing the same work, giving the same output, one employee is on permanent roles, paid a big multiple of what the other person is getting a salary, obviously you are having a tinder box and it can blow up any time and that situation I don't think exists in Japan. Yeah, or, the cases of retail management or understanding the payment situation. Yeah. But you know in Maruti, there is what is called the daily effect. Therefore, the their big expansion is in Gujarat. Two thirds of the business is going to come out more than I guess not one third will come. See, I think the, at the core, the issue here is not just in Maruti, in various industries. At one end, we have very inflexible labor laws. So even if you have, let's say, if a business is 
going through cycles where you have a period of upswing in demand and then demand falls off or whatever you need flexibility to hire people and then lay off some people. If you are very rigid that once someone is hired, you have to keep paying a salary till eternity, then people will opt for this contract labor. And what happens in the contract labor is, you get an outside contractor. That contractor just for assembling people will take a big cut out of that pay and things like that. So, it results in this differential treatment to, for two classes of employees and all of that. So, uh, I think it was not a problem of Japanese uh, culture being tried to impose on Indian workers. It was something which is wrong with our own system. Charlie, common sense usually says don't invest in borrowed money. But in a case like this, where these guys went in and saw second, third generation companies being, you know, having lazy owners, and in most cases these guys have used leverage. Is it leverage good then at sometimes? Because anybody else you ask for the Buffett philosophy is that you never use leverage. And that to dream big without leverage, I don't think it's possible to, to achieve that dream. So, uh, sometimes they had scary moments when uh, there was financial turmoil. Uh, but if you look at the pattern of leverage, in most cases it's by way of preferred shares, which cannot result in you going into bankruptcy. And in the Heinz case, whatever debt was there was also funded by Buffett, by Berkshire. In the form of preferred capital. And there is this Tim Hortons deal, the Canadian coffee chain that they are trying to acquire. Even then, $3 billion will come from Berkshire in terms of uh, preferred capital. So, the whenever you use debt, if at all you use debt, the key thing is it should not be called back. It should not be at the whims and fancies of the uh, banker. If you borrow, short term or a uh, uh, callable debt, then what happens is you may not be able to uh, see through the full cycle, see through the efficiencies coming through and you could be forced into bankruptcy. So to prevent that one, the debt has to be reasonably low cost, second it has to be long term and third there should not be any uh, options for the lender to call the money back. If these three conditions are met, then maybe it makes sense. So essentially it should all be always preferred uh, stock, is that what you say? Either preferred stock or even uh, if it's let's say a 20 year bond which on which you just have to pay interest, before that they cannot force you to repay, then that's okay. Insurance companies have a lot of money. Insurance companies typically, so life insurance companies have long term liabilities. General insurance companies typically will have shorter term liabilities. Uh, most of the companies you have shown, right, all are successful in integrating or leverage back, uh, buyout or something like that, right? My question is any company failed which is not listed here and what are the reasons? For these? Not listed. I mean, what are the companies you have this group, company? 3G yeah. Capital? Yeah. Uh, so, 3G Capital uh, had its roots in uh, stockbroking and investment banking. So, uh, later on when they branched out into these uh, retail companies and beer companies and all of that, there was a split. So, some people looked at the brokerage operations and some people looked at this. And the founders had not, did not give enough attention to those aspects. So, that flounder, that aspect went down then again some people created it back again. So, their financial side of the business uh, did not thrive and today they are not that active on in the brokerage uh, space. Mostly lack of focus. Lack of focus. Also, uh, it's a area which is prone to things going wrong. So, if uh, someone livers up or someone does stupid things uh, in terms of uh, investments and all, then that can get 
Dari Wisma Kita So when we are talking about partnering with promoters or managers as minority shareholders, we are looking at promoters or managers who will deliver good investment results for us as minority shareholders. And what are the factors which will create that? So one, if the promoters or managers are looking at the company as a rental car or are looking at getting this year's bonus or the next year's bonus, then you will have troubles like what happened in the entire financial system, Lehman Brothers or Bear Stearns and things like that. Because all they were worried about was the December end bonus. If they are looking at 5 years, 10 years, 20 years, if substantial portion of their net worth is in the company. So Buffett keeps saying this, saying more than 95 or 98, whatever percentage of my wealth is in Berkshire Hathaway. So I don't want anything to go wrong with this company. So if people are taking maybe 5 year stock options without possibility of exercising them early, or if they are direct stock owners, or if they get a substantial profit share from the company, then they are interested in growing with the company. So you have to evaluate their behavior. Also, are they lean and hungry? Are they having a meritocratic culture? Or are they filling uh, the key positions through nepotism? So these are the kind of things you have to ask of the managers and promoters when you partner with them. Good as leadership. Good leadership. Rajiv Jandabar mentioned about retaining the talent. Now, when you are taking your new companies, most often you know you find people walking away. So, how will you be able to retain the talent most of the time? I mean, there are some exceptions like Fidelity when they sold the business to LNT, Ashu Suresh always, you know, all, all those people came on board with LNT, but that doesn't happen always. Most of the time, people like Rahul Dev, when they take, uh, uh, when the cane was given to Starlight, Rahul Dev just walked away as a professional, you know, good CEO that he was running the company. So how will you ensure that you retain those talent even if you are taking over some company? This will not happen all the time. He didn't say about retaining all the people. He spoke about one, attracting the best people and two, retaining the best people. And he also mentioned that typically when they acquire companies, they are not bothered about employee turnover. So if you acquire a lazy, lethargic company, you are in fact better off than uh, when all those la lazy, lethargic people walk away. Then you can, so let us say you have a 55-year-old uh, person who is the marketing head of that company that you have acquired, who comes to office at 3 o'clock, leaves at 4, uh, has a fleet of expensive cars, goes on private jet tours and basically has a good time and there are uh, shortages of the product in the stores. So let's say Brahma for example, Brahma beer. Now are you better off people leaving or are you better off people staying back? You would be happy if people go. Then you attract the right person. You tell that person within six months I want all the supply inefficiency is gone. I want all these costs under control and if you get this right, this is your percentage ownership of the business. It will attract the best people and those people will work enthusiastically to bring it up. So sometimes when people acquire companies and when they go overboard and try to retain all the earlier people who have got the company to a messy state of affairs in the first place, they are doing the wrong thing. He spoke about uh, people having a long-term relationship, employees having a long-term relationship with a company. For example, if an employer, an important employer of a company has stock options, substantial stock options, how do you see if that guy has exercised his options and is now selling the stock? And he is a very critical part of the management team. For example, in Ayalukas Investment Manager, Mr. Shahzad Pillar is continuously selling the stock. How would you uh, you know, consider it. Sure. 
so there is a difference between stock options and stocks so stock options give you upside and no downside whereas if you actually own the stock you participate both in the upside as well as the downside so to that extent always stock ownership will carry a far far greater weight than the option there's no two ways about it and if you own a company you would want people to exercise the options and then keep the shares rather than sell the shares so this is one of the signals that is key specifically in the case of let's say island fs investment managers so apart from the uh, stock and the options one they have stuck around both shahzad dalal and uh, archana hibora ji have stuck around for 15 17 years and they continue to be there and maybe archana hibora is the key person today shahzad dalal is not that active but also in terms of their compensation a bulk of the money comes by way of profit share so unless the company makes a profit or unless their clients make a profit they don't get that bigger share so that is skin in the game in that sense so any one who's running a hedge fund or a pe fund or maybe in some cases portfolio management services etc they get paid based on the performance of the underlying assets so which is always uh, something which attracts and retains people uh, here also he mentioned that this design they have taken from goldman sachs so essentially this is an aspect which the financial industry intuitively gets it where it has got it wrong is they converted those uh, ownership interests into very short term performance targets and annual bonuses so that was the wrong thing otherwise the design of the financial sector was good in the sense if you earn you get a partner share <coughs> otherwise you get uh, maybe sustainable salary fine i think we have overshot our time yeah, yeah let's uh, <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>